Hi everyone, today I'm speaking with Mr. Nitin Gupta, CEO and co-founder at Atero Recycling, which is one of India's biggest recycling companies. Hi Nitin, thank you so much for joining me today. I understand Atero deals with e-waste recycling and of course lithium-ion battery recycling as well. So to start with, can you give us a sense of scale of operations for both uh, streams? Absolutely, Prakshi. So, uh, Prakshi, Atero is a deep tech company with a very strong focus on sustainability. Mm -hmm. As a company today, we have 46 granted global patents on various recycling technologies developed by us in India. Patents are across US, Europe, Asia, including China, Japan, and obviously India, and more than 200 patents filed for. Out of these 46 granted global patents, uh, roughly nine are for electronic waste, and uh, roughly 37 are for lithium and batteries, okay? And all of these are based on the technology that we have developed in-house in India and globally the best, right? We're also the only electronic waste and lithium and battery recycling company in the world, Priyakshi, to generate carbon credits per ton of waste recycled. So the amount of energy used in Atero's processes to let's say extract pure gold, pure silver, pure uh, sort of copper, aluminum uh, from e-waste or let's say pure cobalt, pure nickel, lithium carbonate, graphite, and copper aluminum from batteries is significantly lower than the amount of energy required to extract these metals, either from a virgin mine or any other known secondary state of these materials, right? As a thumb rule, we generate one carbon credit per ton of e-waste recycled, and we generate roughly two plus carbon credits per ton of lithium and batteries recycled, right? From a scale of operations perspective, our current capacity for e-waste recycling is ballpark 1,50,000 tons, which is operating annually, which is operating at full capacity. Our current capacity for battery recycling is close to around 15,000 tons, which is also operating at full capacity, right? From a revenue perspective, uh, I would say overall aggregate, the company is roughly doing around 1,200 crores annualized revenue. Mm-hmm. Understood. The, great. Thank you for giving us a very comprehensive overview. Uh, so my question is, in terms of uh, technology, you said you have some granted patents. So can you give us a sense of what is your IP focused on and what are those USPs of your processes and your technology? So very broad question, Priyakshi, and I'll try and address it uh, as uh, sort of uh, completely as possible, right? So on the battery recycling side of things, today Atero's technology and IP and patents enable us to have four critical advantages, right? Today, we are recycling all kinds of end-of-life lithium and batteries. So today in the current plant, we are recycling, let's say, LFP battery cells, which is used in your buses or let's say even your Tata Nexon EV as an example. We are recycling various NMC battery cells, NMC 822, 811, 622, other NMC cells as well, which are typically used, let's say, in the Hyundai Kona car in India or Tesla cars outside India. We are recycling LCO battery cells, which are typically used in mobile phones and laptops. We are recycling LTO battery cells, which are typically used in your new hybrid from Maruti Suzuki and the new cars from Toyota and others, right? Uh, and we are recycling all of the battery chemistries out there, right? There are, apart from us, every other company in the world operating in the battery recycling space is only limited to certain amounts of battery chemistries. They can't recycle the whole gamut of battery chemistry. Our IP allows us to recycle all kinds of end-of-life lithium batteries, right? The second advantage is that we are able to recover more than 98% of pure battery grade lithium carbonate, more than 98% of pure battery grade cobalt, nickel, graphite, manganese, copper, and aluminum, right? Globally, that average reaction is less than 75%. So for the same input material, Atero is able to extract almost 50% more output material uh, basis the technology and the IP that we have developed, right? So giving us more revenue and obviously more uh, profitability as well. Third, our CapEx per ton is $3,250 per ton. Globally, that number is $5,500 at the bare minimum. So not only are we generating the highest revenue, we are also generating the highest return on capital employed, right? And lastly, our OPEX is 30% lower than the best firm in the world globally in battery recycling, right? Compared to any of your competitors. So four different key benefits that our technology and IP give us in battery recycling. First, our revenue efficiency or extraction efficiency is significantly higher compared to the market. Our CapEx is significantly lower compared to market. Our OPEX is significantly lower compared to market. And our TAM, 
or the ability to recycle all kinds of batteries is much, much higher compared to anybody else in the market, right? On the e-waste side of things, Priyakshi, our ability to set up a small scale modular plant is uh, is what technology enables us to do. So our minimum operating viable plant capacity for precious metal refining from e-waste is 2000 tons per annum. Globally, let's say Yumicore is at 100,000 tons per annum. That's what technology enables us to do. Understood. No, very, very interesting. In fact, I was reading a, an article yesterday that talked about uh, how US is extracting the maximum gold out of uh, e-waste yes. generated, followed by China. It came recently, two, three days ago. Yeah. So can you help me understand where does India fall in that? Uh, or do we not have as much e-waste or are we as efficient in collection and recycling and extracting that uh, amount of precious metals? How? Where do we stand? So see, uh, from a technology perspective, uh, the technology, let's say, Atero has for extracting precious metals from e-waste, including gold and silver, is best in class globally today. Okay, In fact, better than what the US firms have, better than what Yumiko firm, European firms have, and so on and so forth, right? Uh, so there are three ways to compare e-waste technology. The extraction efficiency of, uh, let's say, precious metal extraction from end-of-life e-waste for a firm operating in Europe, let's say Yumicor, or a firm operating out of the US or Atero in India is ballpark the same, right? But the OPEX to do so, the CAPEX to do so in Atero's case is significantly lower. The modular approach enables us to do so at a smaller scale compared to the uh, companies in Europe and US, right? That enables us to set up these plants in a lot of other markets where uh, Yumicor and other firms cannot set up these, uh, these uh, e-waste recycling plants. Having said that, a majority of electronic waste in India today, Priyakshi, gets recycled in the informal sector using cyanide and sulfuric acid and open coal burning with lead, right? Now, the major competitor for a firm like Atero in India is the informal sector, right? The reason the informal sector can compete with us is because they have no taxation, they have no labor costs, and they have no environmental costs, right? So the cyanide that's used in recycling electronic waste to extract a gold and silver is dumped in the nearby water stream, okay? The uh, sort of lead fumes are basically just fumed away. There's no pollution control equipment around it. That's the reason even with the lower efficiency, the informal sector in India is able to be competitive from a cost perspective, right? Now, what has happened very recently in India, Priyakshi, is due to the EPR regulations or extended producer responsibility legislation that the government of India has very rightly enforced, there is a shift happening from informal sector to formal sector from a material flow perspective, right? So let's say four years ago, 99% of e-waste was being recycled in the informal sector and 1% in the formal sector by Atero. Today, that number is 75% in the informal sector, 25% in the formal sector, right? Hmm. That shift is happening. So although on a per unit basis, Atero probably recovers equal or more than what the US firms are recovering, but on an aggregate basis, because the flows are more to the informal sector in India compared to the US, that's on an aggregate basis recovering, recovering less precious metal. That problem is getting sorted out with the EPR regulations. The government of India is doing a fantastic job of strengthening these regulations regularly and implementing them very forcefully. Uh, and in fact, the latest regulations of EPR uh, set up a minimum uh, EPR fee is also a very welcome step in the same direction. Uh, as a background, right, the uh, hypothesis behind EPR, EPR basically stands for Extended Producer Responsibility, right? Now, it's not only for e-waste, it's across the waste stream. It's not only in India, it's implemented across the world, right? The base, basic uh, sort of premise behind an EPR regulation actually is it's a, a cradle-to-grave approach. The companies who produce, let's say, waste should be responsible for disposal as well. That's the thought process behind EPR, right? Mm -hmm. In this particular case, for electronic waste, EPR regulations essentially put an obligation on OEMs who sell electronics and electrical products to consumers, right? And the EPR regulation simply states that any company who's selling electrical and electronic products in the country is responsible for its end of life, making sure it collects the end of life products and making sure that end of life e-waste is recycled in a scientific manner, right? Mm -hmm. That's the essence of the regulation. Now, this regulation first came into India in 2013, where it was voluntarily compliance. So essentially saying, let's say if Apple collects one cell phone back, they're compliant, right? If they mm -hmm. choose to collect 100,000 cell phones back, they're still compliant, right? So from 2013 till 2017, nothing much happened in the e-waste industry because majority of the flows were still going to the informal sector, right? Mm -hmm. 
in 2017 the government of india strengthened the regulation to essentially say that they will put a target of compliance on each oem based on historical sales that is so many percentage of sales had they have to collect and make sure it's scientifically recycled right when that was done then there was a shift of material flows from the informal to the formal sector hmm. right and over a period of time the epi regulations have become more and more stringent both from a product coverage perspective as well as from an implementation standpoint right okay understood so uh, you are uh, you are headquartered in roorkee so can you also give me a sense of other locations and uh, geographical footprint atero has so we today collect electronic waste across the country we have pandey operation we actually uh, across more than 1400 pin codes right so our operations are spread all over we collect electronic waste uh, and lithium ion batteries also from consumers through a platform called cell smart right mm-hmm. cell smart is a d2c platform where as a consumer you can go online you'll see the price that we'll pay you so the advantage of a, for a consumer to dispose of their electronic waste or end of life lithium ion batteries through cell smart to atero Uh, versus the current supply chain of giving it to let's say kabadiwala is mm. you get a transparent pricing from us you mm. get the assurity that your data is taken care of because when you're disposing of your phone or your laptop the significant amount of personal financial and professional data that's there and data sanctity needs to be maintained right also you are ensured that the uh, e-waste that's taken back will be recycled using a tiro's patented and technologically advanced recycling operations so you're basically helping the environment rather than sort of hurting the environment right so there are multi- and you can do it from the convenience of your home right acha uh, so we pick it up from 1400 uh, different pin codes across the country pan india operations we have one recycling plant in durki we are expanding recycling plants across the country we are setting up four more recycling plants across south west east and north and then we'll continue to expand capacity as well beyond that we actually Okay, so apart from Cell Smart, what other collection streams uh, do you currently have? We have contracts with almost every OEM in the country, Prakashi. So all the manufacturing waste comes back to Atero for recycling. Manufacturing waste essentially means, let's say, if there's a manufacturing facility, manufacturing compressors or an air conditioner, not hundred percent of input will be converted to output. Whatever cannot be comes back to us for recycling. then all the service center waste right so let's say if you have a uh, sort of a washing machine of a particular brand it doesn't work you give it back to the service center they're not able to repair it it comes back to what you for recycling right mm-hmm. then we also collect from aggregators who essentially are the informal sector guys who collect from consumers in the supply chain and that also we are collecting digitally right through an online platform okay i understand currently we are not uh... managing the electronic waste very professionally and efficiently in india can you help us understand what is the economic value of actually efficiently managing e waste disposal resource recovery and recycling so very tough question to answer priyakshi because it depends on what kind of electronic waste you have but just to give you some sense right mm-hmm. let's say if you have for a washing machine mm-hmm. if you recycle a washing machine you can essentially extract almost like a 50 rupees a kg right so if it's a 50 kg washing machine on ballpark so you're looking at uh, 2500 rupees as a economic extraction value of metals and plastic that it contains similarly if you look at a refrigerator ballpark uh, let's say 50 rupees a kg 40 kg refrigerator 2000 rupees right uh, mm-hmm. if you look at a mobile phone you can probably extract uh, let's say 300 rupees from a mobile phone if you look at a computer you can probably extract 1000 rupees from a computer right if you look at parts so now look look at the printed circuit board in a mobile phone you can probably mm-hmm. extract from that single printed circuit board on a per kg basis let's say 1000 rupees a kg right mm-hmm. from a battery uh, it depends uh, again di- different chemistries but between 50 rupees a kg to 500 rupees a kg right okay uh, so it's a wide that's the reason i'm hesitating to give you an answer there's no one figure i can tell you yeah. depending on the input the output will vary If you want to take a very ballpark average priyakshi, then I would say take a very ballpark average of hundred rupees a kg across all electronic waste aggregated together, right? Oh. Is the economic value that you can extract, right? To put that in context, priyakshi, India today generates more than four million tons of end of life electronic waste annually. Okay. Okay. Now four million tons multiplied by one lakh rupee per ton will give you the economic value of e waste in India. Wow. That that's a huge number. How many zeros are going there? Yeah. <laughs> All right. So if we come to uh, 
LIB recycling, lithium ion battery recycling. So the sense I get is we we do have uh, many people who are now setting up lithium ion battery recycling facilities in India. And but most of them are limited to mechanical separation of the incoming batteries. That is, and they produce black mass and that black mass is exported. So uh, can you clarify for Atero uh, what all processes are included in your uh, LIB recycling uh, facility? So first of all, upfront, uh, we are the only facility in the country which can take in all kinds of end-of-life lithium batteries. And we, what we output is pure battery grid cobalt, cobalt actually sheet, uh, which is 99.5% plus cobalt quality. We output pure battery grid lithium carbonate, which is a white powder, which again is 99.7% pure uh, sort of uh, lithium carbonate content. We produce pure graphite, which is again a black powder. We produce pure manganese dioxide, which is a solution. We produce uh, pure nickel, which is again a sheet, right? And we produce pure copper and pure aluminum, right? So everything that comes in is actually recycled and extracted to full pure metals from it, right? Now, from a process perspective, uh, Priyakshi, if you look at this cell phone, right? It's a single cell battery pack. If you look at the, the like laptop on which I'm having this conversation, it's got eight or 10 cells packed together. If you open up your EV, it's got 500,000 cells packed together. The fundamental unit is the cell. If you open up the cell, you have an anode, which is today 99% graphite and 1% silica. After the anode, there's a very thin foil of aluminum called the anode separator. Post that, there is an electrolyte, LIFPO6. Post that, there's a very thin foil of copper called the cathode separator. Post which, there's a cathode. Cathode contains your lithium, cobalt, nickel, manganese, and iron, depending on the battery chemistry. So when these cells come back for recycling, the first process typically that's employed is a mechanical recycling process, like you rightly said, right? In a mechanical recycling process, essentially you're doing shredding followed by some bit of density separation, right? So typically what comes out is two output streams. One is a combination of your separator materials and binder materials, or in simple English, copper, aluminum, iron, and plastic. The okay. other output is a black powder, which in industry parlance is called black mass. It basically contains your cathode active materials and anode materials, right? Or in simple English, it contains cobalt, lithium, nickel, graphite, manganese, and some bit of copper and aluminum. All other firms operating in battery recycling in the country today stop here. Okay. Mm -hmm. Once the black mass comes out, there are essentially two ways to recycle this black mass. One is a pyro methodology where you take this black mass as a cell and you put it in a smelter, right? In the smelter, the smelting point or the melting point of, let's say, lithium carbonate is very low. Okay. It gets lost in slag. Similarly, graphite, because it's all carbon, you cannot recover it theoretically using only a smelting process, right? So get that gets lost in slag. And manganese has a very low melting point, it gets lost in slag. So companies outside India who operate the pyro process, or let's say Yumicor, which is in Europe, they're able to extract 90% cobalt, 90% nickel, 0% lithium, 0% graphite, 0% manganese. And their capex per ton is $10,500 per ton. And their opex is also high because of the energy requirement, right? Mm. The second process is the hydro process where you take this black mass and you put it through various chemical steps like leaching, electrovinning, solvent extraction, right? Atero also does that. Globally, there are a few other firms that do that. Every other firm that does that globally, they're not able to extract more than 75% of cobalt and nickel and more than 50% of lithium and 0% of graphite. Atero's mm. technology differentiation enables us to go beyond these extraction efficiencies and extract more than 98% of lithium carbonate, cobalt, nickel, and graphite, right? Mm. Uh, and the capex per ton, which I explained is low. In our case, it's 3,250. Globally, it's 5,500. Okay, understood. So like you said, for pyro, cobalt is the main output. They are losing lithium and other, a lot of other, like graphite also they're losing. So in India, we are seeing a shift towards LFP batteries. I'm talking about electric vehicles. Yes. So I understand anybody who's looking to do black mass refining in India, pyro will not make sense for them. Uh, economically. Absolutely. That doesn't make sense. Cannot make sense, right? Because mm -hmm. then essentially comes back to the point that you cannot recycle LFP batteries economically. Mm -hmm. LFP batteries have no cobalt. Right. If you have no cobalt, then what will you extract? And then how will you recover the costs? Right, right, right. A simple check, Priyakshi. If you uh, speak to anybody globally saying, I have an LFP battery, would you pay me for recycling? Okay. Mm. People will say, no, we need to get paid for an environmentally friendly recycling. Okay. Mm. India and outside India, Atero actually pays to procure LFP batteries. 
because it is to recover graphite and lithium carbonate and sell it back hmm right that's one of the reasons priyakshi that we are also putting up a battery recycling plant in europe in poland and we are putting up a battery recycling plant in the us as well hmm i understand you have your own in house r&d you have so many patents and uh, a proprietary technology so what is the current focus of your r&d so current focus of r&d is a couple of things so current focus of r&d essentially is this, uh, to say that uh, uh, let's say from a output materials perspective in e waste can we look at alloys so let's say if you're producing pure aluminum can we make alumina as an example right so that's one focus of r&d the second focus of r&d is how to increase the input funnel so we are today looking at rare earth materials so we have recycled magnets which contain neodymium Uh, mm-hmm. and extracted neodymium right so apart from e waste and lithium and batteries what are the other input materials that we can take in and ex- develop a sort of a process and a technology for that rare earths is a critical component there the mm-hmm. focus of r&d today is from future battery chemistries see battery chemistry is changing right and mm-hmm. to be on top of the game from battery chemistry change perspective uh, so what's happening in there can be for the work with the manufacturers to sort of assess what new battery chemistries will come in and do we have a process ready even before they come in right mm-hmm. fifth process is that the materials that we are taking out today how can we upscale them uh, for faster sort of uh, uh, let's say much better value proposition right so pcam materials and other materials as well right okay and you can add to that so today let's say we have taken out an electrolyte which is in the batteries in the r&d lab so we are sort of pushing the limits of technology innovation even within recycling a lot priyakshi okay understood and uh, for the end products you are generating out of uh, lithium ion recycling uh, cobalt lithium who are currently who are the uh, customers for these products our output material goes to the top oems globally because okay. it, like you rightly said does not have a cam or even a cell manufacturing setup right in india lithium carbonate is used in allied industries for example pharmaceutical industry every okay. single psychotropic drug psychotropic drugs are used to basically reduce the brain activity so if you mm-hmm. read the ingredients a key ingredient is lithium carbonate right so mm-hmm. our output is not only battery grade it's pharmaceutical grade so some companies in india use our output in making the medications right and some mm-hmm. companies outside india use our output to make new new cells right mm-hmm. similarly cobalt is used in india in specialty chemicals and outside india it's used in batteries as well so there are both these use cases for us and okay. uh, other products as well okay and what kind of uh, capacity uh, do you anticipate uh, will be required going forward so incoming volumes are going to change significantly having said that priyakshi today as we speak there is close to around 1 million tons of end of life lithium and battery waste available for recycling globally okay out to this 1 million tons more than 75% is coming from manufacturing waste and less than 25% is coming from non manufacturing waste wherever these cells are manufactured facilities are called gigafactories because they measure the capacity in power output right energy output every gigafactory has 10 to 25% of capacity as manufacturing waste today the global gigafactory capacity available globally is around 400 gigawatt hour right so roughly 60 gigawatt hour of manufacturing waste gets generated today okay this gigafactory capacity is growing 3x in the next 5 years so the mm-hmm. manufacturing waste is also growing 3x right so that's one set of the equation the other set of the equation which is less than 25% today which is non manufacturing waste that's essentially coming from end of life consumer electronics it's coming from end of life uh, ess packs energy storage packs it's coming from let's say uh, ev recall battery packs and it is coming from end of life evs right now end of life ev is the most fascinating growth scenario in this bucket because like you rightly said ev started getting deployed globally 10 years ago and the next 2 years this is going to grow at a crazy exponential rate right so if you extrapolate this 1 million tons number in the next 3 years this is going to go to 2 million tons right out of 2 million tons today let's say 25% is non manufacturing out of 2 million tons 50% will be non manufacturing that is growing much faster so yeah. that recycling capacity has to expand at a very very frantic pace to keep in line with the end of life disposal that's already happening right in our opinion uh, lfp batteries will start to dominate hmm. so one shift that we are clearly seeing right 
it's also a function of geography because of protectionist regulatory policy europe and Euro us will continue to be dominated by nmc although lfp will be cheaper and more sort of powerful as a battery chemistry but india and other countries will have a predominant lfp battery chemistry that's point number 1 point number 2 there are new battery chemistries that are coming out for example lto where the mm -hmm. anode is titanium and not graphite right where the cathode has a much lower cobalt content as well right uh, that's another shift. Third shift that's happening is a solid state battery. So instead of an, a current battery, which is an electrolyte in there, we will probably see a shift to solid state batteries in a reasonable period of time, just because they're safer and so on and so forth. Fourth shift on a much longer term basis is a metal air battery completely do with cobalt and stuff like that, right? The reason that's got slowed down today, Priyakshi, is because the lithium and cobalt and nickel prices, not so much nickel, but lithium and cobalt prices have crashed. So the mm -hmm. price of a lithium and battery available today is almost 40% lower than what is it was available 12 months ago. So the economic cost consideration of benefit versus price between let's say a zinc air battery and a lithium and battery LFP is not there today, right? Mm -hmm. So, but hopefully over a period of time that can happen. So we have to be prepared from an R&D perspective. Yeah, we are, and we are seeing some uh, announcements on sodium ion side as well. So yeah. zinc air, sodium ion, all of those. What are some of the current challenges do you think India should address or the industry should address? To, Of course, there is a lot of work being done from the government side and from the regulation side. But what are the other recommendations being an industry practitioner to make the overall e-waste and LIB recycling process more efficient, more profitable also? So a couple of things, right? So from a, uh, I think the lens that needs to be applied here, Priyakshi, is a critical minerals lens, right? And national security lens. Because ultimately, both of these waste streams are essentially producing metals and minerals on for which India as a country is dependent on China or other countries, right? So if you look at what's happened in the US, if you look at what's happened in Europe, US has actually spent almost $100 billion plus out of the IRA Act saying any project in the US, which is basically for the critical minerals industry, whether it is for recycling, refining, whatever it is, they will give a lot of significant grant to enable that project to happen, right? They do not want to be relying on China for the critical mineral supply chain. Mm -hmm. Similarly, European Union has put trade barriers on input from China, right? Mm -hmm. So Indian policy today is good from a regulation standpoint on EPR angle, which is basically shifting the industry from informal to formal, but there has to be a lot of emphasis on capacity creation. There's a lot of emphasis on sustainability and critical minerals aspect. And probably a lot more financing is required for the sector to be able to develop the capacity at the speed that the capacity needs to develop. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, so that is one probably thing that we really think is essential. Right. And there are ways and means to do so. Right. See, all of us understand that India does not have as much capital as like, the US has. Right. But US has already signed a few countries as signatory to the IRA Act. So let's mm -hmm. say if you develop a project in Morocco, you still get a benefit of the US IRA Act. Mm -hmm. So that's one simple policy suggestion we've also given to the Commerce Ministry that why can't India become a signatory to the Critical Minerals Act and any industry that puts up, let's say, a pre cam material processing facility or a refining facility or even a cell manufacturing facility gets the benefit of the US funding. Mm -hmm. right? So that's one simple thing. Second aspect is probably a PLI scheme in the critical mineral sector, which the government is already thinking of, right? Which will cover the entire e-waste and battery recycling aspects as well, where companies who are technologically advanced and do value addition domestically and do and uh, sort of make for India will get the benefit of some bit of capital allo allocation to them, right? Uh, and other forms of, let's say, capital uh, interest subvention and so on and so forth, right? The last point here is because the majority of the supply chain is shifting from informal to formal. There has to be some sort of uh, GST rationalization that is required here and not because of rates. All we are saying is uh, in the metal scrap industry or e-waste or lithium and battery, the government should introduce RCM, reverse charge mechanism. Right. As a company, if a tailor is buying from somewhere and we pay tax on that uh, particular vendor's behalf, our liability is over. Right. Mm. I'm, we're not saying change the tax rate of stuff, but bring in RCM for better transparency in the sector. Okay. Okay. Those are some critical aspects that we're talking about production.
Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Nitin. Great, great talking to you. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you.